360 degrees. High high, 360 degrees. High high, 306, 306, 360 degrees. High high. Welcome to Full Circle, the magazine show created, produced, engineered, and hosted by members and graduates of the First Voice Apprenticeship Program. The show is broadcast from Hu Chen, a.k.a. Berkeley, in the East Bay. The Bay Area has a rich literary history. In the article by Joan Morris, published by the Bay Area News Group in their 2022 bookish supplement, she points out that established and aspiring authors have used the Bay Area's versatile settings to, quote, spur their imaginations, feed their characters, and simmer their plots, end quote. That article was the inspiration for tonight's show. On tonight's Full Circle, we'll hear from some authors who have Bay Area connections, some well-known, some locally known. Stay with us to learn who we'll hear from tonight. We'll be right back. Welcome back to Full Circle and our exploration of some Bay Area authors. The first Bay Area author we'll hear about is Philip K. Dick. As Joan Morris wrote, he moved to the Bay Area as a boy, attended Berkeley High School, and for a while attended UC Berkeley. In his early 20s, he began writing science fiction. While his name may not be immediately familiar, the movie based on his book, Do Androids Dream of Electric Sheep?, is somewhat of a cult classic. Movie makers changed the setting to Los Angeles, but Philip K. Dick's sci-fi classic was born and bred in the city by the bay. The book was adapted by screenwriters Hampton Fancher and David Peoples, and titled Blade Runner. It was filmed in 1982 and was set almost 40 years ahead to 2019. In these clips from YouTube, we'll hear the voices of the Cyber Chaos crew narrator, along with Harrison Ford, who plays android hunter Rick Deckard, and director Ridley Scott. I'm Ridley Scott. I've just completed production on my latest picture since Alien. Blade Runner, starring Harrison Ford as the classic hardball detective, is based on Philip Dick's novel, Do Androids Dream of Electric Sheep? I need your deck. This is a bad one, the worst yet. There was an escape from the off-world colonies two weeks ago. Six replicants, three male, three female. They slaughtered 20... A Blade Runner's job is to hunt down replicants. Manufactured humans you can't tell from the real thing. What's this? Roy Batty, probably the leader. There was just one outfit making replicants that superhuman. The Terrell Corporation. Mr. Deckard, Dr. Eldon Tyrell. I don't get it, Tyrell. Commerce is our goal here at Tyrell. More human than human is our motto. I was looking for six replicants in a city of 106 million people. You ever seen this girl, huh? Never seen a buzz love. What I didn't know was they were looking for me. This is the city, Los Angeles. The year is 2019. The buildings are a lot higher. All the decent folk live hundreds of stories up. No one in their right mind wants to be on the street. But you gotta be rich or a cop to own one of the flying cars. 
with most animals extinct, constant acid rain, and 106 million people, well, let's just say things haven't exactly gotten any better. The film being made is Blade Runner, a futuristic detective thriller starring Harrison Ford. Ford plays Rick Deckard, Blade Runner, a detective whose specialty is replicants, manufactured people no one else can tell from the real thing. When they go wrong, it's his job to stop them. It's not an easy job to like, but if you're a Blade Runner and you're good, they'll never let you quit. Life's not all bad, though, if you've got a few of the modern conveniences. Like a spinner, one of the flying cars used by the police to patrol the city. A two-way video telephone. Or a detective's best friend, his Esper. A home computer that can search a room by scanning a photograph. Enhance 34 to 46. Track 45 left. Stop. Give me a hard copy right there. Let's listen as an expanded explanation is given of the hunted, a.k.a. replicants, and the rebel replicant leader, Roy Batty. They were designed to copy human beings in every way except their emotions. And the designers reckoned that after a few years, they might develop their own emotional responses. You know, hate, love, fear, anger, envy. So they built in a fail-safe device. Which is what? For your lifespan. Only they're born without a capacity to know that or to understand that. These replicants are a lot smarter and stronger than real humans. It's illegal for them to even be on this planet. International star Rutger Hauer plays Batty, the brilliant leader of the escaped replicants. Morphology, longevity, incept dates. Don't know. I, I don't know such stuff. I just do eyes. Just eyes, just genetic design, just eyes. You Nexus, huh? I design your eyes. They want more time. And my job is to find them and eliminate their threat. Detective work hasn't changed much. You get too close to the truth and someone tries to change your mind. All it takes are guts, instinct, and intelligence. Nothing is worse than having an itch you can never scratch. The replicants are originally developed for off-world situations, both military, industrial, mining. They're kind of second-class generation developed for inhospitable environments, dangerous work, boring work. There will come a point maybe where if you're going to send an astronaut off into deep space where he'll never come back, and he knows he'll never come back, you may want to send a replicant. Replicants are humans in every way except for emotions, and this is done for a purpose. They were created to be laborers and were given short lifespans in order to not develop emotions over time. If replicants develop emotions through experience and might eventually learn that they only have four years to live, that might breed a particular crisis from within, resulting in a murderous being. Therefore, Tyrell found it necessary to implant false memories into the replicants in order to quell this emotional blow. Like all detectives from Holmes to Marlowe, Deckard has to be able to adopt a quick personality change to handle new situations. Excuse me, Miss Salome, can I talk to you for a minute? I'm from the American Federation of Variety Artists. Oh, yeah? I'm not here to make you join. No, ma'am. That's not my department. Actually, uh... I'm from the uh, Confidential Committee on Moral Abuses. But on the street, there's no time to think twice. A Blade Runner has to smell trouble and act fast if he wants to stay alive. One of the things about Deckard is that he's fighting a fear. But it's not something he likes to do, to shoot people. It doesn't seem very easy with authority. Uh, and besides which, he seems to be on the losing end of almost every encounter. So he's reluctant at best to be doing what he's doing, but he does it pretty well. 
Right, Eckridge, you look almost as bad as that skin job you left on the sidewalk. I'm going home. Could learn from this guy, guy. He's a one-man slaughterhouse, that's what he is. Four more to go. Come on, Gaff, let's go. Three. There's three to go. There's four. But while the inner city decays, the suburbs have grown into sprawling industrial landscapes. Deckard's first lead takes him to the headquarters of the world's largest replicant manufacturer, the Tyrell Corporation. In Tyrell's office at the top of a 400-story pyramid, Deckard first encounters the girl. You know, the beautiful, mysterious type who will always turn up in stories like this. Newcomer Sean Young plays Rachel. I'm Rachel. Deckard. It seems you feel our work is not a benefit to the public. Replicants are like any other machine. They're either a benefit or a hazard. If they're a benefit, it's not my problem. At one point, uh, Deckard is introduced to Rachel, whom he expects to be a human being. And at a certain point, he finds out that she's not. Not too big a shock for him. The shock for him is that with no place else to turn, she turns to him. And suddenly, he's confronted with uh, a woman in his life. How many questions does it usually take to spot one? I don't get it, Tyrell. How many questions? 20, 30, cross-referenced. It took more than 100 for Rachel, didn't it? She doesn't know. She's beginning to suspect, I think. Suspect? How can it not know what it is? Commerce is our goal here at Tyrell. More human than human is our motto. Rachel is an experiment, nothing more. She knows how to handle this corporation that she works in. But when she gets in a situation, which she eventually does, where she has to relate to somebody physically, sexually, emotionally, she is as close to a virgin as any, anyone could, could be because she, she's never had the experiences, regardless of what, how much of a woman she may look like. So she is in this situation with Deckard where he tries to kiss her and she runs away and Deckard stops her and is not exactly violent with her but he realizes somewhere that this must come to pass that they love one another and she learns what um what what emotions are because of the pain of the situation and the pain of having to feel something for the first time sooner or later it all boils down to the final struggle between the cop and his quarry in blade runner the confrontation scene between deckard and batty is a terrifying chase through decaying buildings and across rooftops hundreds of stories above the ground. The climax builds to a savage fight between Deckard and the super powerful replicant. Six, seven, go to hell or go to heaven. Then we come to the scene, where in just a few words, all of the film's themes and messages come together in a perfect circle, like a bow on a gift. With Roy's final words, he proves that his memories and his mercy transcend his heritage, the awe and wonderment he has experienced in his short time alive, and the way he describes that awe communicates to Deckard as well as the audience the true value of human life. Tears and Rain the monologue is often quoted as the most moving death soliloquy in cinematic history. Quite an experience to live in fear, isn't it? That's what it is to be a slave. I've seen things you people wouldn't believe. <laughs> Attack ships on fire off the shoulder of Orion. I watched sea beams glitter in the dark near the ten hours of gate. All those moments will be lost in time. Like tears in rain. Time.
powerful. We just heard Rucker Hauer's haunting performance from the film Blade Runner. Based on Philip K. Dick's sci-fi novel, Do Androids Dream of Electric Sheep? For me, Roy's speech underscores the importance of passing along personal stories. And now a music break. The Blade Runner final credit theme music as created and played by Vangelis. Welcome back. This is Full Circle on KPFA 94.1 FM. If you're just joining us, that was the credits music from Blade Runner. Our theme tonight is Bay Area Authors. The next author we'll learn about is Nellie Wong. Nomi Windmaker tells us about her. I was 20 years old and working at Modern Times Bookstore in San Francisco when I first came across one of Nellie Wong's poems in the anthology, This Bridge Called My Back, writing by radical women of color. I remember being struck by the first line in one of her poems titled, When I Was Growing Up. She wrote, I know now that I once longed to be white. Reading those words by a Chinese-American woman made a big impression on me. Her vulnerability and her bravery inspired me as a woman of color to also write freely without apologies. Nellie Wong once said in an interview with the Freedom Socialist Party, When I began writing poems, I realized I had definite ideas. My first professor told me I was bitter. Bitter. Luckily, I met strong women who said I had a right to write angry poems. Wong's poetry is fiercely honest. She writes to disturb the silences and to provoke the invisibility that she was expected to maintain as an Asian American woman. Her poetry is not just a creative expression, but an interrogation on racism, sexism, and the politics of class and labor. A lot of my poems come from the workplace. That's where I've experienced a great deal of sexism and racism, Wong once said. San Francisco Bay Area Nellie Wong is a Chinese-American poet, feminist, and union activist. She was born in 1934 during the Great Depression in Oakland, Chinatown. She is the daughter of Chinese immigrants and a graduate of Oakland High School. Wong began writing poetry in her 
30s when taking a creative writing class at San Francisco State University. There she met other Asian American feminist writers who inspired her to write about her own life experiences and that of other Chinese Americans. Nellie Wong has published four collections of poetry, Dreams in Harrison Railroad Park in 1977, Death of Long Steam Lady, 1986, Stolen Moments in 1997, and Breakfast, Lunch, and Dinner in 2012. Wong's poetry has been featured in over 200 anthologies. She co-authored a book with Merle Wu and Mitsuye Yamada, three Asian American writers speak out on feminism. Wong also was a co-editor on Voices of Color with Yolanda Alanez, and she is a founding member of Unbound Feet, a writing and performance collective by three Chinese American women who dare to dismantle racist and sexist stereotypes about Asian Americans and immigrants. And now we hear Nellie Wong reading at the Flash Reading Series, and then she reads the poems for Closure and Eric, read at the 2015 Labor Fest. Hello, my name is Nellie Wong, and I will be reading poem Crossing the Nation. This was inspired by reading the San Francisco Chronicle on November 12, 2020, at the time of the pandemic. And uh, this poem was birthed from reading several articles. Crossing the Nation. Forgiveness resists his tender arms. Alexander Hamilton, did you indeed enslave blacks? You, the father, purported the founding father of abolition, hailed in rap and song on American stages. Your work with the Manumission Society helped to abolish slavery, did it not? Threading through veins, forgiveness harumps and sighs. What? Migrant women who alleged abuse by a gynecologist in Osceola, Georgia, soon to be deported. Imminent removal from these unwelcoming shores, not enough to be incarcerated, torn from their children. I sending patients to you, Dr. Mahendra Amin, highly respected for treating them with hysterectomies. Allegations or not, truth rallies, does it not? Go, go away, forgives us, you with thorns prickling with sunlight. These eyes sauntered down, refuse to stop reading. Florida's governor expands stand your ground law, allowing armed citizens to shoot suspected looters. Vigilantism to be upheld as monarch on streets in court. Border wall less than half finished stands. Knock it down, raise it, sell it off. Chunk splinters, fragments to build homes, hospitals, schools. After $15 billion thrown with verbosity to keep immigrants from Mexico, Honduras, El Salvador, Guatemala out. Women escaping domestic violence Drug warlords, hunger, leave the border wall in place and affront to humans' indigenous dreams. No use for 556,000 tons of steel, 797 cubic yards of concrete. Ah, Congress refuses to provide full funding. Ah, partial funding, though, not truly criminal, but partial, better than nothing, to make our nation a laughing stock. By year's end, oh, bless us, 450 miles to be completed. Homeland security only for the anointed lords and barons of capital, excess, prophet as king, the poor, the afflicted, be damned. Staghorn coral grow, polyps, proliferate, saturate underwater colonies, their skeletons, garden form, fingerlings of underwater rock, reefs, migrations, harmony of storms, no words filtering through steel bar to be deported. Thank you. 
I will share two pieces with you tonight. And my first one is called Foreclosure. For Carlene Balderrama, Woman Shoots Self Over Foreclosure. Taunton, Massachusetts, San Francisco Chronicle, July 14, 2008. Okay, come on in. Never mind that I am lying here stone cold. Doesn't matter anymore. Look in the cupboard. There may be some Cheerios in the fridge. There may be some milk at least half a pint to wet your whistle. Be careful. Don't stomp on my body. Just walk around as if you're in a mausoleum, or better yet, as if you came to pay your respects. I faxed my letter to the mortgage company this afternoon after I drank a cup of Starbucks coffee. So go ahead, Mr. Auctioneer. See what you can get for this house. Small, cramped, but where I lived with my husband and kids. Just go ahead, see who the highest bidder is. Just make sure you feed the cat. And don't take away my husband's high-powered rifle. He owns it, free and clear. This poem is called Eric. Sells the street sheet from 9.30 a.m. to 6 p.m. In front of Books, Inc. on Van Ness Avenue. Born in Algeria 77 years ago. Algerian father, black American mother, sixth wife. But didn't want to be a sixth wife brought Eric at seven to the United States. Lived in New York, Kansas, and Texas before arriving in San Francisco in 1989. Helped his stepfather delivering produce. Worked as a laborer laying concrete. But jobs difficult and had no money to join the union. Had two daughters, one 26 now, in Sacramento, who come to visit him on Van Ness Avenue as he sit, street sheets fanned on his lap. Empty plastic containers and plastic bags surrounding his concrete home on the sidewalk. His daughters give him a few dollars when they can. Two different women, one saying, there's good vegetables inside, laying a bag down marked with Max's Opera Cafe next to his wheelchair. The other woman comes out of her car, slips a $5 bill into Eric's hand, his arthritic fingers peeling with dry skin, saying, haven't seen you for a while, darling as she dashes up Van Ness. Eric keeps peeling skin off his left forefinger. This is where I got knifed. A guy tried to rob me, pointing to the gallon jar with five pennies and a nickel inside. Luckily, he had held up his hands in front of his chest. Otherwise, he would have been sliced on the neck or through his heart. The cops caught him, didn't get my money, his mouth moving, showing no teeth. Three years ago, got cut on the forehead, lifts his watch cap to reveal a one-inch scar, sells 20 street sheets a day if he's lucky, needs $26 for a room for the night, otherwise goes to the shelter. If no bed, he can sit up and sleep, get a shower in the morning, gets lots of pennies. A man brings him a roll, unrolls it, and pours 500 pennies into his jar. 
Why don't you just give him a five dollar bill, his wife asked. Because I want to give him something to do. His mom taught him to read and write, likes to read stories and poetry, been selling street sheets for over 10 years now. The cops no longer harass him because he doesn't do drugs, doesn't do alcohol. Besides, the sidewalk is public space. I'm Muslim, Eric says. Muslims cause no harm. The people in the condos at Opera Plaza, some drop coins into his jar, some don't. A lady at the corner panhandles, doesn't compete with Eric, but passes by, tell her, why don't you go back where you came from? Don't need his kind around, pointing to Eric. And how's that, she retorts. Where can I go? Some people give her quarters, maybe a bill, but only pennies to Eric. Why? Cause she's white, he says without grimace. Likes it when his six-year-old granddaughter visits his home across from a bordered McDonald's where another man sits on the pavement as if guarding the abandoned building, as if guarding it is a sanctuary for passing his day in silence. Eric saves his pennies. This is for college, as he thrusts a jar at his granddaughter on the sidewalk next to him. Thank you, Grandpa, she says. She calls me Grandpa. Majestic, Eric sings out. I call her Majestic. Thank you, Nomi, for selecting Nellie Wong. And our next Bay Area author, Maya Angelou, was selected by Pamela Lyons. Let's listen. Maya Angelou knows why the caged bird sings and how the streetcar bell rings, too. The future poet and civil rights activist was born in St. Louis, Missouri, and spent her early childhood there and in Arkansas. But when she was 14, Angelou and her brother moved to Oakland to live with their mother. Angelou became San Francisco's first black female streetcar conductor at age 16. I saw women on the streetcars with their little changer bells. They had caps with bibs on them and form-fitting jackets. I love their uniforms. I said, that is the job I want, she told Oprah Winfrey during a 2013 interview. Angelou may have wanted the job, but the job didn't want her. She was denied an application initially but she just kept showing up every day to ask for one until she finally got it, and the job. Fortunately for us, Angelou began writing, and she never stopped. And here is a gift from Maya Angelou. This poem was written on behalf of the American people on the occasion of the death of Nelson Mandela on December 5, 2013 at the request of the U.S. Department of State. I give you His Day is Done, read by Maya Angelou. His day is done, is done. The news came on the wings of a wind, reluctant to carry its burden. Nelson Mandela's day is done. The news expected and still unwelcome reached us in the United States and suddenly our world became somber. Our skies were leaden. His day is done. We see you, South African people, standing speechless at the slamming of that final door 
through which no traveler returns. Our spirits reach out to you, Bantu, Zulu, Rosa, Boer. We think of you and your son of Africa, your father, your one more wonder of the world. We send our souls to you as you reflect upon your David, armed with a mere stone, facing down the mighty Goliath, your man of strength, Gideon, emerging triumphant, although born into the brutal embrace of apartheid, scarred by the savage atmosphere of racism, unjustly imprisoned in the bloody maws of South African dungeons. Would the man survive? Could the man survive? His answer strengthened men and women around the world. In the Alamo in San Antonio, Texas, on the Golden Gate Bridge in San Francisco, in Chicago's Loop, in New Orleans' Mardi Gras, in New York City's Times Square, we watched as the hope of Africa sprang through the prison's doors, his stupendous heart intact, his gargantuan will hale and hearty. He had not been crippled by brutes, nor was his passion for the rights of human beings diminished by 27 years of imprisonment. Even here in America, we felt the cool, refreshing breeze of freedom when Nelson Mandela took the seat of presidency in his country, where formerly he was not even allowed to vote. We were enlarged by tears of pride as we saw Nelson Mandela's former prison guards invited courteously by him to watch from the front rows his inauguration. We saw him accept the world's award in Norway with the grace and gratitude of the Solon in ancient Roman courts and the confidence of African chiefs from ancient royal stools. No sun outlasts its sunset, but will rise again and bring the dawn. Yes, Mandela's day is done, yet we, his inheritors, will open the gates wider for reconciliation, and we will respond generously to the cries of blacks and whites, Asian, Hispanics, the poor who live piteously on the floor of our planet. He has offered us understanding. We will not withhold forgiveness, even from those who do not ask. Nelson Mandela's day is done. We confess it in tearful voices, yet we lift our own to say thank you. Thank you, our Gideon. Thank you, our David, our great courageous man. We will not forget you. We will not dishonor you. We will remember and be glad that you lived among us, that you taught us, and that you loved us all. With your bitter, twisted lies You may trod me down in the very dirt But still like dust I rise Does my sassiness upset you? Why are you 
beset with gloom Cause I walk like I've got oil wells Pumping in my living room Like moons, like suns With the certainty of tides Just like hopes springing high Still I rise, I rise, I rise, oh still I rise, I rise, I rise, oh still I rise. Hmm. Hmm. Did you want to see me broken? Bowed head and lowered eyes shoulders falling down like teardrops weakened by my soulful cries does my heartedness offend you don't you take it awful hard cause I laugh like I've got gold mines digging in my own backyard So you may shoot me with your words And you may cut me with your eyes You may kill me with your hatefulness But still I rise, I rise, I rise Oh, still I rise, I rise, I rise Oh, still I Does my sexiness upset you? Does it come as a surprise that I dance like I've got diamonds at the meeting of my fives? Oh, out of the huts of a history shame, up from the past that's rooted in pain. I'll rise, I'll rise, oh. Still I rise, I rise, I rise, oh still I rise. That was Maya Angelou's And Still I Rise, as performed by the dynamic Miss Faye Carroll. It was recorded for Full Circle in the KPFA Performance Studio some years ago. Thank you, Pamela, for your contribution. Coming up next, our own Freewheeling Franklin shares some of his thoughts and some information he gathered about beloved mission poet George Tirado, along with a special reading of one of George's poems by Josiah Luis Alderede. Good evening, everyone. This is Free Will and Franklin, and tonight I'm going to be speaking about San Francisco poet George Tirado. I didn't know George personally, and in fact, I only learned of his poetry in 2018, and that's nine years after he passed away in 2009. 
When George passed, he was 44 years old, and as I try to learn more about George Tirado, I find there's not a lot of information about him out there. In fact, I don't even know his birth date. But I do know that when he passed away, he was 44 years old, and that was 2009. So doing the math, we know George was born in 1965. George was huge in the San Francisco spoken word scene, and he came before the poetry slams were the big thing. His poems were direct from the streets of San Francisco, as well as other places he lived or spent time. His vivid and visual descriptions came from his visual surroundings, his deep thoughts, and artful imagination. According to poet and writer Bucky Sinister, as he posted online to Life Journal, George struggled with drugs and alcohol. His friends, such as Bucky, hoped that George would find his way and get clean. But George ended up remaining addicted and ended up isolating himself from many of his friends due to the various acts of addiction that came out of this drug and alcohol use. Another article I found on Poetry Flash, Literary Review and Calendar for the West, dated February 2009, says, George was not only active in the poetry scene of San Francisco, but also Phoenix, Arizona. The article goes on to say that George spent many hours with numerous legendary artists, such as poet laureate Jack Hirschman, also Lydia Lunch, and beat writer Hubert Selby Jr. George was even known to hang out with Henry Rollins. Among many of George's great accomplishments in his short life was being a co-founder and member of the Molotov Mouths, a collective of politically engaged poets based mainly in the San Francisco Bay Area. Founded in 2001 by George Tirado, James Tracy, and Amanda Estiva, they were known for their powerful poetry and spoken word and infusing the black and Chicano cultures and bilingual content. Molotov Mouths went on to bring in a range of great poets. And it just so happens that one of them is First Voice graduate and producer of the Spanglish Power Hour, right here on Full Circle, our own Josiah Luis Alderete. He told me that George Tirado was a huge influence in his life and the direction of his poetry. Josiah says he was getting into the voices of Chicano writers and poets, but he had never actually seen one in real life, kind of in the wild, as he said. But George Tirado was his first experience, seeing it happen as well as hearing it happen, and it affected him deeply. Josiah went on to reflect about one of his favorite memories with George, was actually an acid trip they were on. It was in Washington, D.C., and they ended up at the Holocaust Museum, and they ran into Ozzy Osbourne. Josiah also confirmed what I read from Bucky Sinister's short article, George Tirado Died Recently, that George was still struggling with the drugs. And if you didn't know George, he was a rather large man. So the drugs and alcohol just led to terrible health conditions along with his large size. In Bucky's opinion, he felt George was another example of a great writer who never gets where he's supposed to be because he f***ed on his talent with drugs. And he felt that the idea that the drugs and alcohol help him create was bull. I'll spare you my thoughts on that theory, but I will share with you that learning about George Tirado reading his poetry and reading these articles that I recently discovered has me feeling like I wish this man was still here. I wish we could still hear his voice or experience what may have come in his writing. But at the same time, like many other artists, rock stars or performers that just couldn't pull out of it before their own destruction, his words are here for us. You can find George Tirado's work in his books and collaborative works, Molotov Mouths, Explosive New Reading, 
Three poets, one car, poem for a road trip. From my heart, revolution. And the final observation of a techno shaman. Finally, this leads me to the piece I get to share tonight, written by George Tirado and performed by fellow Molotov mouth poet Josiah Luis Alderete. And it strikes me to first share this last quote from Bucky Sinister's article, George Tirado Died Recently. Bucky says, quote, George and I shared a fascination with dirty earthbound angels as images in our work, unquote. Here's an example of that statement in George's poetry. This is Angels, written by George Tirado as part of the Molotov Mouths and performed by Josiah Luis Alderete on a full circle poetry show from November 17th, 2018. You heard our own Freewheeling Franklin with a tribute to San Francisco Mission District poet George Tirado. Also included in that tribute was a reading of George Tirado's poem, Angels, and that was read by First Voice graduate Josiah Luis Alderete. Thank you, Franklin, for that special tribute. And we'll post links to the two articles Franklin referenced from Live Journal and Poetry Flash on our website just after the show. That's kpfa.org. Also, that poem that was performed by Josiah Luis was pulled from a video, and you can find the link to that YouTube video on the website, KPFA Apprentice, just after the show tonight as well. The last Bay Area author that we'll hear from this evening is, yes, Josiah Luis himself, a prolific spoken wordsmith. He was a member of Kumba Voces, Group 40. And now we hear his introduction to himself as recited on the Kumba Voces intro show in 2015. Thank you, Josiah Luis. After running a successful taco eatery in Marin County that he had to release because the property changed hands, Josiah Luis was the proprietor of a wonderful taco truck. Then he worked at City Lights Bookstore in San Francisco. Now he's the co-owner of Medicine for Nightmares Bookstore and Gallery in San Francisco's Mission District. Let's hear from Josiah Luis Alderete. In describing myself, which is the whole point of this show, I'm going to just tell you all that I am a full-blooded pocho indio who refries his poesia and frijoles in Spanglish. <laughs> and although once a proud son of San Pancho's Mission District, I now reside in a giant piñata somewhere on the Oakland-Berkeley border. I am the original Chicano stoner taco shop owner. I was a junkie, I was a Molotov mouth, and now I am a proud member of Cuomba Voces. And I promise you, querido listeners, if you give me half a chance, I will be the Wolfman Jack of your dreams. But it seems that through it all, most of all, under this quinto sol, I want to be a symbol for my culture. It's kind of like I want to wrap myself up in a colorful poncho, tilt an oversized sombrero over my eyes, lean up against the nearest prong cactus I see, and I want to take an afternoon cultural siesta the hell away from all of this. I want to be a symbol for my culture. I want to round up all the chihuahuas out there in TV land, the talking ones, take them back to my place and feed them helping after helping of Taco Bell. I want to tell you the wrong thing when you ask me what this song is about. I want to take care of your kids and secretly teach them Spanglish swear words. I want to give away the endings to all the telenovelas. I want to be a symbol for my culture. I want to wear me Nacho Libre wrestling mask, Che Guevara t-shirt, and Zapatista ski cap all at the same time. I want to start the Frida Kahlo unibrow trend over there in Marin County so that all them San Anselmo yoga moms going into their green beauty salons for their weekly Brazilian bikini wax will instead come out with their eyebrows patched. I want to be a symbol for my culture. And at this point, I would like to personally thank Al Pacino's Puerto Rican and Cuban accents for all they've done for us. I want to appear in old sitcoms as the character whose thing is to always end up walking away mumbling Spanish gibberish. I want to finally see the remake of Home Alone starring Ilian Gonzalez shot entirely on location in Cuba. 
I want to continue to flatten down our hand-me-down language so that's easier around here for everyone else to pronounce words in places like Corda Madera, Los Gatos, Tiburon, El Cerrito del Norte. I want to put pictures of La Llorona's kids on milk cartons and have you seen me posters? I want to put a stop right now to the rumor that narcotraficantes have been smuggling dope into America in J-Lo's butt. I want to be a symbol for my culture. I want to be the sugar skull with Andy Lopez's name on it. I want to be the sugar skull with Alex Nieto's name on it. I want to read the subtitles backwards. I want to erase the border and repaint it two feet to the left. And while the Minutemen and all those other guardians of America go out and investigate, I want to go out and take their jobs. I want to use up their medical benefits. I want to steal their cars, move into their neighborhoods, and impregnate their daughters. I want to be the coyote that people hire to take them back to their childhood. I want to teach white people in San Rafael how to use a leaf blower in English. I want to start a support group for people that have seen the Chupacabra. I want to volunteer to be the Mexicano who rapes Donald Trump just to prove a point. I want to be a symbol for my culture. I want to keep cradling the immigrants' American dream like it's a fussy sleeping baby. I want to be that Yucateco rolling sushi. I want to be that salvadoreño blowing leaves off a lawn in Tiburon. I want to be that 19-year-old chilanga taking care of the baby that she's got in tow as she window shops those Mill Valley boutiques that she'll never go into. I want to be that Mexicano with a red smock and cap looking like a watered-down disciple of Huitzilopochitli as he washes cars at that gas station over on 2nd Street. I want to be that Chicano who opens up a taco shop and names all the burritos after famous Mexicanos. I want to be a symbol for my culture. Thank you again, Josiah Luis. That brings us to the end of tonight's show and our look at some Bay Area authors. Thanks to Pamela Lyons, Nomi Windmaker, and Free Will and Frank Sterling for their contributions. I'm Mickey, the training director. Frank Sterling is our technical director, and our production consultant is Joy Moore. You can check out our archive segments at kpfaapprentice.org. La Onda Pajita is next. Please stay tuned. This is a community announcement. You're invited to join the Haiti Action Committee for a spectacular afternoon of poetry to benefit the Haiti Emergency Relief Fund. The event takes place online on Saturday, August 27th from 3 to 5 p.m. Poets include Devora Major, Tongo Eisen Martin, Havacha, Francisco Herrera, and Shanga Labossier. This virtual event concludes with time for an open mic. No one turned away. To register and for more information, go to bit.ly slash Poetry for Haiti 2022. The community calendar is produced by the First Voice Apprenticeship Program. Please send your wheelchair accessible listing to calendar at kpfa.org. This information is available online at the kpfa.org website. This is for my folkers who got bills overdue. This is for my folkers, um, check, one, two. This is for my folkers, never live like a hog. Me and you, toe-to-toe, -to -toe, I got love for the underdog. This is for my folkers who got bills overdue. This is for my folkers, um, check, one, two. This is for my folkers, never live like a hog. Me and you, toe-to-toe, -to -toe, I got love for the underdog. Boots Riley, a voice synonymous with passion, integrity, and vision. No other station has been bringing you voices like these for nearly 70 years, except KPFA. You're listening to 94.1 KPFA, 89.3 KPFB in Berkeley, 88.1 KFCF in Fresno, 97.5 K24-8BR in Santa Cruz, and online worldwide at kpfa.org.